Hello, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this ICSD session. We will be starting very shortly, but we're just going to allow for a few moments for people to start connecting. I see that people are slowly connecting. So again, welcome everyone to this ICSD session. It's morning here in Europe, but wherever you're joining from, welcome. Okay, great. Welcome everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, no matter where you are in the world. We are so happy to welcome you to this uh, ICSD session uh, of our conference on um, sustainable development, um, an international conference that is uh, being organized by uh, DSDSN. My name is Andrea Eratz and I work at SDSN as a network manager. And I'm very pleased to uh, introduce you to this joint session co-organized by SDSN, RCNOE, and Impetus Projects. Uh, feel free to say hello to us in the chat and tell us where you are joining from. All of us are joining from different locations. Uh, so it is so wonderful to organize this in, uh, in this hybrid mode. Um, our uh, RCNOE and uh, Impetus Projects are the two uh, EU uh, Green Deal. Uh, sister projects that are focusing on adaptation to climate change uh, that is being done through uh, systemic solutions and innovations for climate uh, resilient regions. So the whole idea of our session today is that sustainable development uh, projects and programs uh, can no longer revolve around the success of a single uh, piece of technology or a, a single approach, but uh, that's it is about promoting some deeper transformation, some more comprehensive uh, approaches about bringing different stakeholders together and actively promoting human engagement, interdisciplinarity, learning by doing. So this is the approach that is being taken by uh, the Impetus, the Arsinoe project, but also um, the FABLE program on food and land systems. Uh, and we are so happy to be working on the on all of these with our uh, partners uh, throughout Europe, throughout the world, uh, to support the EU climate change uh, adaptation uh, strategy. Uh, so uh, we're very pleased to be to be here uh, with you. Um, I already said, uh, feel free to say hello in the chat, but also uh, as we go on, please feel free to use the Q and A function to. Uh, raise any, any questions and we'll uh, try to um, answer them. Um, with us here uh, today, uh, we have uh, Professor Gunther Pauli, who is an economist, an entrepreneur, and uh, you may have heard of uh, his most famous book uh, called The Blue Economy. He will be uh, giving us a um, introductory speech, um, which is a, a recorded video. In that video, you will see that he will be referring to some slides, um, but uh, for some technical issues, we will not be showing them simultaneously. However, we will be sharing his presentation in the chat, so you will be able to follow that. And after his speech, we will be switching to um, a moderated uh, session. Um, our session will be moderated by uh, Laura Dernford from the European uh, Science uh, Communication Institute. Um, and on the panel, we will have uh, Chrissy Laspidou uh, from the University of Thessaly in Greece and from the Arsinoe project, uh, Dr. Martin Drews, senior researcher uh, from the Technical University of Denmark, uh, Dr. Aline Monnier, uh, scientific director from the Fable Consortium, uh, as well as Dr. Andrea Marinoni, 
uh, associate professor at the Arctic University of Norway and also uh, speaking on behalf of the Impetus project. So that's all uh, from me for the moment. Um, let's get us all uh, started. Welcome again, everybody, uh, and enjoy this session. We will now be sharing the video from Professor Gunther Pauli. It is a special privilege to be able to address you at the opening of this International Conference on Sustainable Development. I apologize that uh, due to urgent travel, I am now in Colombia and your nine o'clock in the morning is uh, unfortunately my four o'clock in the morning. So therefore, I am pre-recording this uh, message to you and uh, under the eyes of the elephant behind me, let us all be very clear. We can't do more of the same. The challenge that we are facing today is very clearly that with all the great efforts of so many people, with the thousands of initiatives undertaken by millions of people, we have not been able to turn statistics around. The statistics that are coming at us and the experiences we have lived through with uh, the huge environmental disasters ranging from the forest fires to the heat waves to the flooding tells us very clearly that it is time to have a fundamental shift in our approach. Doing less bad and promising to do be good by 2030 or 2050 just will not do it. We have to change our approach, be much more ambitious, and therefore I am urging everyone to stop analyzing, to stop debating, and to focus on the doing. And when you're doing, let us be very clear that we need a visionary approach. Those who see the invisible will be able to do the possible. If we're only going to do where everyone is agreeing on, then we will never have the breakthroughs that we require in order to steer our societies and our businesses towards sustainability. Here I'm showing you a flower, the thistle, il cardo in Italian, le chardon en français. We are showing it distal because to me it is very much the symbol of the kind of transformation we need. The thistle has always been considered as a weed, something that is of no use. And actually in many countries around the world, you have the obligation to destroy the thistles with glyphosates, with herbicides. Ladies and gentlemen, today, Novamont, the company I chair, has developed a biochemistry that allows us to use the thistle, which is available on 20 million hectares around the Mediterranean, to use the flower that does not need any pesticide, herbicide, fertilizer, seed control, GMO, whatever the modern agriculture is prescribing. And it only needs to be harvested. It is a perennial plant that will keep on growing for seven years, keep on expanding its roots throughout the soil and give us a flower with an extraordinary oil. Ladies and gentlemen, let us demystify plastics. It is an oil that with pressure and temperature is converted into an acid. And then you need a sugar and the sugar is fermented into an alcohol. When you have an alcohol and an acid, you have a monomer. When you have monomers, you can make polymers. Ladies and gentlemen, we can produce today thousands of tons, hundreds of thousands of tons 
of biodegradable plastics, provided we use the resources that nature is providing to us, like the thistle. 20 million hectares will generate thousands of jobs and eliminate this obsession with a petrochemical plastic that is only perhaps degrading in the soil and never degrading in the sea. Because the bacteria that are degrading in the soil simply do not exist in the sea. No university today is teaching chemical engineers to graduate with a degree capable of designing plastics that will degrade in the soil, in the sun and in the sea. We need to be able to go beyond what we know today. But it's not only the production of the plastics using bioresources that are abundantly available that we need to focus on. The next slide you see the drama of all petrochemical facilities. Here in Porto Torres, in Sardinia, the first cracker in 1962 built in order to turn the petroleum into a broad range of useful products. Those facilities, 50 years later, are a burden to society. They are characterized by heavy pollution and the impossibility to compete. Now we have two options. We close it all down and dismantle it, or we use the human intelligence to imagine how to convert a petrochemical facility into a biochemistry facility. And this has been done. Now, once you are producing bioplastics, you can start deriving a broad range of products that will not only use and give value to the thistle and give an impulse to the local economy by converting those old petrochemical facilities in production centers of value, at the same time, we can produce products like the diaper. Here you see a diaper, which is one of the products of modernity. But should we have diapers that are simply sent to the landfill or to the incinerator? Or should we have diapers, as you see here in the picture, that will provide us the black soil, the earth that we need? So the thistle combined with human excrements, thanks to these bioplastics, turns back into a soil. But a soil in itself is no purpose. The soil, in the end of the day, is to grow something. Ladies and gentlemen, the apples we're eating today only have 5 or 10% of the nutrients the apples used to have 50 years ago because we have depleted our soil. We need to regenerate the soil and therefore you need to have the business model that takes you from the resources that the earth is providing to replenishing those resources while generating value added and taking care of the problems of the past. The business model is not to have just biodegradable plastics. The business model, the societal regeneration model, is to have apples that are full of nutrition. It is impossible to talk today about sustainable development without discussing energy. Here I'm leaving you in the closing of this short introduction with the image of Porima. Porima is the experimental boat that already in 2010, 2012, over two years demonstrated one can go around the world with solar energy only. Afterwards, the boat was expanded with hydrogen produced from seawater, an intelligent kite capturing wind at 200, 300 meters altitude. And instead of a boat zigzagging against the wind, this boat is going straight because it's the kite that is doing the zigzag. That alone is offering us a 30% improvement in energy performance. The maritime sector is the most polluting sector we know, and nothing serious is being done that gives us a perspective 
that is now another perspective in 2050. Porima is the goddess of the future in Roman mythology. Porima is the goddess who will give us the view, the vision and the passion to really change reality around us. I imagine and I'm dedicated to not have one boat going again around the world. I am passionate and enthused to be able to create three boats, ten boats, a hundred boats. And why not, through a collaborative effort worldwide, a thousand boats under the watchful eye of the element behind me. Let us all commit to stop talking and to focus on doing and doing what we don't know and accept that unless we take the risks, we cannot do the magic of steering our societies towards sustainability and secure we can correct the errors of the past by regenerating this grand ecosystem with its billion years of experience. Have a good panel discussion. Thanks for the invite. Thank you very much to Gunter Pauli, economist and entrepreneur, for providing us with that very interesting video. Um, it's a pity he can't join the panel discussion, but I'm sure the panelists that we do have available today uh, will make a great job of contributing their thoughts about what he said, as well as their answers to the questions that I'm going to put to them in just a moment. So thank you to all of you. Um, Chrissy uh, Laspidu, unfortunately, can also not be with us and has provided some answers to the questions that I'm going to ask by, uh, uh, in video format as well. Um, so we are going to hear from her, thankfully. Um, so just coming to what we've just heard, um, there were some examples in that talk from uh, Professor Pauli of specific technologies, of specific developments, um, but also uh, the example really of how they can interconnect to form a whole sort of system of solutions that support each other and uh, really lead to a lot of uh, value being created along each step of that chain, which is really the fundamental principle that he described in his book, The Blue Economy, um, I think around 10 years ago. Um, so drawing on your own areas of expertise and experience uh, and work, maybe you could give us your thoughts. Why do we need this kind of systems thinking, the big picture and the interdisciplinary approach if we're going to be able to tackle climate change in a sustainable way. Um, let's start with uh, Chrissy's contribution on the video, please. Okay, maybe we need to uh, get that lined up. In which case, um, would you mind, Alina, if we get your thoughts on this first of all, and then we can come back to Chrissy's video at the end if we uh, if we if we still need to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. So indeed, I think that uh, this introductory presentation from uh, um, Dr. Pauli is, uh, is, is a really good starter <laughs> also for us. So I think that maybe let's take uh, from uh, my position the, the example of the food and land. And I think that indeed the, um, the previous presentation already showed a few examples uh, from uh, land, also based on land, that could be used to uh, really implement this, uh, these changes which are needed. So let's, uh, let's take this example of using uh, land and the natural resources to um, replace some of the, um, the products which are currently uh, done in an unsustainable way. Um, so the example of the thistle was, was taken previously and also the example of 20 million hectares that could be used to, to do that. And indeed, like sometimes it's really, um, I think, a, a good idea. And I, I, I'm sure that uh, the, the consequences of that have been taken into account. But uh, in many uh, places before, for example, there has been this case of biofuels policies and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and the fact that it's, it would be so great to substitute uh, oil by uh, biofuels. And here also we saw that if we don't take a system approach, uh, we can really have some big, big problems because uh, currently land is used for something in most of the places around the world. Uh, it, it is to grow food or it is also to just let biodiversity 
biodiversity uh, um, thrive, uh, which is also quite important, or trees to be, and to carbon, and to store carbon for now and for future generations. So there are very important trade-offs when we're talking about land. And if we don't take that into account from the start, then we run the issue uh, that we had for biofuels, for example, with uh, government acting, which is great, putting targets, mandatory tar targets for governments to, to do that, which is the way to do it. But then after going backward, and then this is terrible for the business because then you start to invest, but then you have to go back. So I think this is one concrete example where I think the system is view is very important and land is really at the so many trade-offs uh, which uh, really that's key for my, my domain. Thank you. Thank you. So um, maybe next we can hear from Martin Drews. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so Martin, um, you're involved in uh, various areas of interdisciplinary work and, <coughs> excuse me, co-chairing the uh, collaborative program on high impact events and climate change of the European Climate Research Alliance, as well as being an advisor on the uh, European climate risk assessment. Um, do you feel that there's enough joined up thinking amongst all the various bodies that are working in this area? Um, and what evidence do you see or examples could you give us from, from your experience of this interdisciplinary approach and big picture thinking that is so critical? Well, thank you so much. Uh, I think the um, I see a lot of potential, but I have to say I also see a lot of silos still. I mean, if you if if you think about it, uh, there's been a lot of research going on in in this area, as uh, as we also just heard from the uh, from our keynote speaker here. And uh, given the fact that, that that there's been so much massive research, it's really amazing that. Then when you think about it, and and I'm in, as you say, I'm very much involved in, in sort of climate ex extremes kind of research, uh, but also from sort of an interdisciplinary perspective, just the fact that, for example, adaptation to climate change and mitigation, as we just heard, is generally perceived in a policy level, at a practical level, at a scalable level, as two different silos, is sort of, uh, a, to me, a danger, because if you think about it, uh, I mean, it's. I mean, we we, we have we heard also from the lady Aline a moment ago about the about the necessity to really think about land use, and then if you think about how we defend ourselves against the most extremes that are that are already here, I mean, land use is one of the most uh, precious and efficient types of sort of adaptation in many different ways, but land use. I mean, is also, I mean, land is necessary for so many other things. So when do you, when do you have to compromise? What is the right decision to make? I mean, you can model, you can use science, you can use all different kinds of things, but at the end of the day, it's only in the interplay between the different people, between different disciplines, between the different priorities that you actually get to, to a good point. I mean, an example from the, from, from the talk, for example, uh, why? I mean, we saw this plant that was in, that that was uh, located next to uh, next to the sea. Well, that's a that's probably for a very good reason. There's cooling water. There's other things. You know, it's sort of accessibility, but it also makes it uh, susceptible to climate change, to storms, to actually sea level rise. So, I mean, did they think about that when they actually built it, or when they are rebuilding it? That's a that's that's a that's a that's a that's a very good question. I've experienced in tons of examples of my of my of my own work, of my own resource, of my interactions with stakeholders, with sort of policymakers that no, that was not the sort of intention. In fact, not not very long time ago, I was involved in a project in uh, that was actually in Serbia where they wanted to make a new sustainable uh, wastewater treatment plant. And uh, they they did everything right. They did all the they they factored in all the stakeholders. They factored in everything. The only thing they uh, they missed and failed was the fact that they built they planned to build this plant in the most uh, flood prone place in the entire area. So that was very good. So you 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 do all the steps, but you forget one part, and that to me speaks volumes about how you actually need to to factor in 
also those things you don't normally factor in, yes. like risks, but also potential. So I think this is, a, a, and I mean, I liked just to, um, another example from, from the talk. I really liked the, the sort of the image of the thistle because the thistle is really a very resilient plant. So that might actually be a very good place to go back to actually Aline's comment also that, I mean, why is a thistle interesting? I mean, as, 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 as was said, the thistle is something we, we, we tend to think of as wheat, but it's actually a resource. And it's, it's, it's one of those resources that will stick around for a long time after the temperature went up by 32 degrees, if we allowed to do that, because it's just so resilient. It can take anything, all the punishment, that, that sort of climate change can really give it in the in the uh, in the short term, and it's still here. It still contributes to the the sort of mitigation kind of things, and to to start ensuring that we have a sustainable supply of the resources that we can't do without. So Thank I you. think this is a uh, that that was sort of a few examples for me on that aspect. Great. Thank you so much. So. Yes, just to pick up on a couple of the things you've said, you talk about the thistle being a nice example of resilience, and you also talked about um, the uh, interplay between people and the, the science. Um, in other conversations uh, outside this event, Professor Pauli has talked about resilience basically being down to how do you react to a surprise or a change uh, in circumstances. And the point about um, having the interplay between people and the data and these kinds of things is so that we can be more resilient. And um, so this is something, Andrea Marinoni, uh, that I would like to just bring you in on, um, because um, this is something that the Impetus Project is very much taking into account, isn't it? Combining, if you like, societal data with the more traditional kinds of uh, data that we would use for climate research. Can you maybe just very briefly explain that and how this um, touches on this whole area of um, uh, the big the big picture interdisciplinary approach? Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me and good morning to everyone. Um, yeah, uh, basically the, the idea underneath uh, that, that uh, rely, uh, all our approach from it is, uh, relies on is that uh, basically uh, climate change uh, adaptation and mitigation that must, must not be two different silos as Martin was saying, uh, is actually a problem that, uh, for which uh, the solution is to find a way to actually make one plus one more than two and even more than three sometimes. Um, so to some extent, uh, uh, our, um, our approach in Impetus uh, on one side is uh, focused in providing better informed decision-making processes for all the sectors uh, involved in, uh, in society, uh, either industry, research, communities, uh, rather than environment uh, or, or, uh, um, or uh, eventually also administration and government. Um, this uh, uh, this uh, takes advantage of the fact that uh, uh, sensors are all around us, and uh, so we can gather uh, data on uh, all uh, all different phenomena and uh, events that uh, that characterize our everyday life. So uh, by by using uh, artificial intelligence and uh, modern modern machine learning methods, uh, uh, our ambition will be to extract the most reliable information out of all these data, so to to make uh, the administration and the, and the decision makers uh, in, in the best place uh, to 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 perform uh, any possible adaptation and mitigation measures that uh, could uh, could be. Uh, uh, could be uh, the, the best for a specific region. Uh, the point is that uh, data analysis by itself will not make the magic in the sense that uh, to, make, uh, to make these measures uh, and policies uh, be um, effective uh, for, uh, for, uh, to, to address uh, climate change effects, uh, what, uh, what we have to do is to involve uh, the, the stakeholders, the local communities, the local administrations, so, uh, uh, make them engage with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, the creation of their uh, adaptation measures uh, and, uh, and mitigation policies, 
so that uh, it, it will be possible to actually perform what, what in impetus we call the co-creation process of, uh, of these portfolios of solutions that uh, could lead to uh, the creation of uh, adaptation pathways for uh, possible uh, all the different uh, biogeographical uh, regions for our project in, in, in Europe, but uh, that, uh, that uh, could be a set of solutions that could be eventually also scaled up to, to other, uh, other regions uh, in a sort of federated manner. Thank you, Andrea. So, yeah, talking about decision making and um, those uh, kinds of processes that need to happen, I think arguably we're up against a bit of a challenge because political systems, project funding cycles, making profits in businesses, they all tend to have a, a short-term cycle, a short-term view, just a few years uh, at most. Do you see this as a barrier to sustainability and climate change solutions? And how could we maybe encourage a longer-term viewpoint? This is going to be a question for all of you, but if uh, Chrissy's video is ready to play, I think I'd like to hear her answer to this one first. Uh, yeah, the, the duration, the, this uh, limited duration of terms, uh, political terms, um, you know, of uh, businesses, uh, project fundings, all this is definitely, um, uh, uh, is definitely something that hinders uh, results because people don't have this long-term um, uh, effect in front of them. Um, so this is where uh, we, again, need to focus on. Uh, we need now uh, to establish the mechanisms, the ministries collaborating with each other, uh, the institutions that will address uh, climate change uh, as a whole, and that will address, uh, you know, how to achieve the, the SDGs. A lot of this cross-sectoral collaborations uh, are needed in order to be able uh, to have good results and to overcome uh, this uh, uh, short term. Uh, it's, it's obvious that uh, politicians will be elected for a limited amount of time. We can't change that, and we don't want to change that. Uh, what we want to do is to establish this uh, um, uh, in the, the institutions and the process uh, that will be able to support uh, the, the solutions and the ideas long term, and we'll have a strategic planning that will span across uh, po uh, political systems and political leaders and figures. We can't be dependent on that. This also uh, puts more pressure on what needs to be done, how we need to think outside the box and redesign the whole process. Thank you, Chrissy. Uh, Alina, what would you like to say on this point? Yeah, thank you. Um... I would like to say that uh, most of the decision makers uh, need to be convinced that uh, the longer term or thinking long term is also at their benefit. So, and I think that in the case of, uh, of, of climate change, I think it has to be really clear to them that uh, climate change now and, uh, and the long term impacts of climate change have an will have an impact on their business. So they have to think this long longer term, they have to think about this potential long-term effects if they want to be here in 20 years or 30 years from now, uh, and if they want to have the competitive advantage in 20 years. So uh, for policymakers, it might be a bit more complicated because maybe their career <laughs> might be shorter than that, but uh, I still hope that uh, they can think that they, they can uh, drive uh, momentum and leave a, a country in a good uh, place by having this longer term and uh, view. And, and I think that this is what is needed, really to convince them about the need and their benefits to have that. Thank you. What, what about the point about project funding cycles? Is that something, Andrea or Martin, that, uh, that one of you might want to uh, come back to? Well, I can take a stab at that. I mean, it's a, uh, it's definitely so that I mean, project funding in 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 a sense, of course, holds things back. But it's also a matter of what projects are we talking about? Are we talking about research projects? Are we talking about, as as was already said in the keynote? I mean, in doing. I mean, we can research a lot of things, but it's also about transforming the solutions that we have 
into into real pathways as uh, as mentioned in this in this uh, session here i mean because i think in terms of some of the, some of the some of the solutions will take a long time i mean Aline knows exactly what i'm talking about if you want to change land use and land use patterns and implement things at a really decisive scale it takes time and i mean those sort of projects are not over in two three years they demand commitment but if the commitment was there as as already mentioned by or by both chrissy and by aline then that the, the i would say the sort of sky's the limit but it's definitely at the moment it is uh, the the project funding not j just in research but also is really holding back stuff i mean i don't know how that would be changed i mean perhaps i would say that the that the that the, that the european union has done one thing with its upcoming horizon europe program where they try to coordinate more than 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 that in the old days like for example in this in in this case uh asinoe empathos and transformar and their csa action uh called the resilience are all sort of formed in a way that they work together you know not just as 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 four independent projects that sort of do the same thing but they actually they are in they should work together in fact the entire portfolio of projects are more coordinated than they've ever been and that means that the projects suddenly become much more impactful than the than the otherwise that's one way that you bring it out i mean i don't know if it's it's as we say it's probably completely impossible to imagine until we sell the narrative that actually Aline is talking about, that we will have 10 year projects. But at least it's a it's a first and for me encouraging start that people starting to coordinate things in a much better way because it means more impact and that you can do more things than we could in previous uh, project funding programs. Thank you. Yeah, and talking about the, uh, the research side of it, um somebody in the audience has asked the question tying this back to what uh, uh, Gunter Pauli said which was he said we need to change our approach so the question from the audience what does this actually mean in practice for example in research uh, if we're going to stop analyzing and start doing how could people working in academic practice actually translate that into their work um, Andrea Marinoni um, you actually work in in research in academia how would you respond to this question I, I think that this is a very nice question also because it's um, it is rather very on, on the earth, as I uh, used to say, in the sense that rather, um, taking out rather, activities from, uh, from the pure academic world rather, is, uh, is pretty tricky uh, in the sense that uh, uh, we experience rather, when, uh, when trying to reach out to communities uh, rather than industrial partners uh, rather than uh, administration, that uh, there is still some gaps in terms of uh, the operational needs that, uh, that uh, must be addressed in order to make all the, all the research and the scientific studies that we make uh, in our, our universities uh, um, available and uh, able to, to address all the issues that, uh, that are actually affecting uh, everyday life. Uh, so the point is that uh, engagement is, uh, is tricky, uh, but and uh, I mean I resonate with all the, the discussion that has uh, uh, come before me in the sense that uh, um, there, uh, having a short-term project uh, is, uh, is quite tricky because people don't see that much of uh, an effect of some of these uh, longer-term uh, climate change effects uh, on, on their life and uh, establishing longer term pro uh, projects or uh, initiatives might uh, be tricky from a policymaker perspective well i think at that, that point uh, that, that's uh, one of the uh, one of the angles where the diversity and the, the, the interdisciplinary uh, the approach that, uh, that has to be taken that is a necessity for climate change adaptation mitigation might uh, might make a difference in the sense that uh, uh, this sort of uh, need, this sort of uh, uh, requirements uh, should uh, might come uh, from from the communities, from the industries, and from the education sector themselves. So, for instance, uh, what we what we can do is to try to change the climate um, 
climate mindset for uh, for communities and uh, also for the younger generations for instance uh, at the university establishing new uh, new university courses uh, rather than involving um, uh, arts and, uh, and communities in order to to to, to perform the initiatives that are the, um, that are the, could uh, phrase the research activities in terms of cultural or artistic forms that uh, that could uh, make uh, the communities engage uh, more with, uh, with the problems that we are addressing from a, from a scientific community perspective rather than working with uh, uh, science roadshows uh, at uh, community centers uh, or or eventually also educational games that uh, could help in, in this respect. Uh, now, there is a, 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 big, a little bit of a problem here. This requires effort in the sense that uh, everybody has to uh, step out of their comfort zone and, uh, and try to, to reach out to other, to other sectors. And that might not be, might not be easy. But the, problem, the point is that this big challenge that uh, like could, could show up as a big mountain of problems in front of us uh, is also a motivation for us to try to climb up and, uh, and uh, find a solution for this because after this big challenge there is a big opportunity for all of us uh, in different sectors of our society. Thanks Andrea. Yeah you very nicely anticipated one of the things that I wanted to ask you all about which is about diversity um, and, and how uh, that's why is it necessary and, and how to encourage it if it's necessary. Um, Alina, I think uh, this is something that uh, maybe you would like to begin the comments on. Yeah, thank you, but uh, let me react a bit to your previous questions before, because I cannot resist to disagree with uh, Dr. Pauli. Uh, I think that uh, indeed it's urgent to act, but some people need to act, some other people need to analyze and keep analyzing, you know. I think that we provided two examples before with Martin that really, I think, uh, show that need to continue analyzing in this context of deep uncertainty is one on, for example, biofuel policy. Second is maybe where to build a plant. And of course we need to, to build plants which are for a circular economy and so on. We probably need to use more land for um, bioeconomy or so. But without analysis, uh, you really risk to lock yourself into not sustainable, not uh, profitable solutions that will last for, for a long time. Uh, so please, scientists, at least continue analyzing, continue to do your job to think about it and to provide policymakers with good analysis. And of course, maybe it's not waiting 10 years to get the perfect analysis done to provide policymakers and working more closely together, more in a learning by doing together, kind of in a in much more interactive way. But I, I, I really uh, urge people to keep analyzing. So that's, uh, that's one thing. I think that Martin also maybe wanted to quickly react to that point. So I don't know if he wants to do it now and, and we take to the diversity question afterwards. Sure, but maybe if you could keep it quick, okay. Martin, that would be great. Thanks. Yes, I want to. Um, I can certainly do. I mean, I I do not dis disagree with you at all. But I think one of the things is uh, one of the things that I think the, the 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 person asking the question was was talking about is I think it's it's also a matter of courage, because I think it's a matter of of being able to not just analyze but also be part of the process. And I think it's difficult for scientists sometimes because it means that you will get your hands dirty. You're no longer the sort of neutral observer, you become part of it. And, and I know one of, the, one of the things that I'd like to highlight that very briefly uh, in the, the Asinui project is, is essentially built around a systems innovation approach. So it's a, it's a research and innovation project in the sense that it builds on, on the systems innovation approach where you basically sit down with people and really get your hands dirty and they are involved and we are sitting and and basically you go back and tell your phd students well uh you have to go to this in this city or this in this community and sit down with them for x number of months and actually uh structure and think about your phd research in terms of of the real life challenges whether they are big or small instead of just thinking okay i need to write a really fancy publication you need to actually solve a problem and I think that that is difficult. And I think we work with this every day and not it's not for everybody, but some people are better at analyzing and some people are better at getting their hands, their hands, their hands dirty. But I think we need to definitely push more people 
into that direction where we are participants rather than just analysts. But that use, but analysts are useful too. Yes, thank you. Sorry to interrupt. So, which brings us back to the point that diversity is needed, of course, because different people bring different uh, skills and knowledge and areas of interest. So, coming back to the question of diversity, uh, perhaps actually we could just uh, play in Chrissy's response to this if, uh, if her video is lined up ready to go. Ah, yes, diversity, um, gender diversity, um, people diversity, the age, uh, uh, race, we, we definitely need to be diverse. And in order to achieve our, our goals, we definitely need to include everyone. And um, this is part of the SDGs, is part of what uh, our goals uh, should be. Uh, indigenous people, marginalized people, those are the ones uh, sometimes that are affected the most. Uh, by climate crisis, so we definitely need uh, to bring them on board and include them. Uh, again, this is something that takes a lot of effort to change minds, uh, to uh, go beyond the conservative thinking that uh, um, male representations, for example, uh, are sufficient and um, uh, young people need to be taken into account. Uh, we need to make new leaders. I think this is again a matter of education. It's again a matter of us uh, as uh, scientists communicating uh, correctly this uh, information and passing uh, the messages um, uh, to make it really uh, a part of um, a conscious of uh, reality, uh, the diversity. On the other hand, uh, we have the policies, we have the quotas that need to be uh, enforced and the, uh, the, the European Commission and other uh, entities are really uh, helping in that um, by bringing uh, out, uh, you know, uh, gender uh, and diversity. Uh, biodiversity, I mean, uh, what, what can I say? Uh, biodiversity collapse uh, is really one of the biggest threats uh, of uh, our century. And uh, it is something that I definitely need that needs a lot of work. Uh, water, people see running out, energy, um, they see food, I mean, all these resources are very tangible and they see them. Biodiversity, they cannot see so much. So we, again, have a, a mission here uh, to, to convince, to enforce uh, metrics, to, uh, to show how it is degrading and to explain what it means. Uh, it is really critical that we do this because uh, yeah, biodiversity, as you all know, is a, a huge part uh, of who we are now, and maybe um, COVID, COVID is related to the biodiversity collapse, the fact that we are, we have these new invasive species, uh, and all that discussion. So uh, it is, um, it, this needs to become conscious, it need, we need education, we need initiatives to convince people, and we need the metrics to scientifically measure in an easy, easy way to communicate to regional and national leaders. Thank you, Chrissy. Yeah, so metrics, that comes back to the point you're making also about measuring and analyzing things. And, and Chrissy is also talking about the need to communicate more clearly. Maybe I can connect that thought then back to um, the question about the value of things that, uh, that we're talking about. And a question from the audience again about um, you know, in, in business, what are the alternatives to making a profit? What role does value play here? And tying that to what Chrissy's raising in terms of biodiversity and the value she's hinting at there in biodiversity, um, how can we encourage this notion that uh, these things are important so that people are more willing to get involved in, in the change that needs to happen? Alina, I tried coming to you first last time. Maybe I can come back to you first again now. Thank you very much. So indeed, I think that this diversity issue is very important because I think that uh, people uh, take decisions only when they are really convinced about them or some, if they act really with all their energy, they need to be convinced. And so it's very important to connect this broad message also for the SDGs or for the Paris Agreement and so on with what people can experience in their kind of real life with their own constraints. So if the message is too broad and too general and doesn't connect to what they experience, then we are losing them. Uh, they cannot act. They don't know where, where to start. They don't know why. So I think that uh, having an approach uh, which is probably more decentralized, 
uh, also in terms of uh, the with global uh, message and, and so on is more it's quite important also in terms of, of, of science so for example with fable what we try to do now is really to use this this network so that uh, the pathways for the long long-term pathways can be uh, built by people in their countries right not only by the global modelers and who have a view about how the, the, the world should develop, but that they can decide on what is important, what kind of dietary shifts they can do, should do, and so on, and try to progressively see also these impacts at the global level. So then they can be convinced with several iterations that, okay, the actions that they take have an, an impact at the global level, and also the actions that the overall state have an impact on their pathways. And I think that by that, trying to reconcile whatever their preferences, because we are a diverse world, and it should remain like that, but also we have only one world, one planet, and uh, at the end it has to come to uh, together uh, to, to preserve this planet. Thanks, Alina. And uh, yeah, I mean, basically what the conversation has been doing increasingly is sort of putting together the, the role for the science, the, the data, the data modeling, the technology, and the need to involve people at various levels in society. Um, and I think that second need has been increasingly recognized and is now seen as a key area of the work as we've been hearing. Um, so perhaps just very quickly, I could ask all three of you to maybe even give us some very specific way in which your projects or your organizations are working towards that. And what are the challenges and opportunities that you see uh, in that work? Um, Martin, how about we start with you this time? Okay, well, I can I can make it very uh, quick. Well, I mean, we are, I mean, I'm from the Technical University of Denmark. I'm also a happy member of the of the Asinui project and, uh, and many uh, international boards and stuff like that. And I think one of the one of the overall things is that there is, I think the challenge is that sometimes you need to, as was already mentioned also in the chat, is the is the thinking. I mean, I think there there is a challenge in the in 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 getting to the point where actually Aline is uh, uh, is is sort of highlighting that where we are where, where we all realize that we're in the same boat, and that that's that is one way to do it. And and I mean, one of the in Denmark here, where I come from, one of the one of the one of my colleagues usually talk about funding funding events whenever you have a big natural disaster, and at the global level, uh, that's. I mean, that works very much at the local level because people sort of get together. I mean, just look at uh, what happened during the COVID. That was a global funding event, if you like. Uh, but that's also one, the first example of this. So what, what my organization is doing, of course, is to try to figure out how we go beyond that and sort of communication, communication and education is, an, is insanely important. But also, again, making, making these things, you know, push these things into policies, somehow putting them into targets and policies. Uh, and you, you do that by working with, with sort of policymakers and with, uh, with the education at, at school level, at, I mean, at all levels, to try and sort of push and, and share the information that we, that, that we, that we have. Uh, and, and I mean, that's, and, and again, and also responding to to one of the comments in the the in the Q and A just just here in the in the end, I mean I think indigenous people's knowledge uh, or just local people's knowledge. I mean sort of broadly all the knowledge that we ha we have, making thing making use of this is actually a, a very big part of it. I mean, uh, if you look at the reindeer herders in the northern part of uh, of Sweden and Norway, which we which uh, which which I talk to often, I mean, they have so much information about what is actually going on up there, and how one could adapt to it, that 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 needs to be heard, because they have already sometimes solved some of the some of the problems in terms of making sustainable solutions, uh, that by going in by going nature-based, by working with nature, that sort of uh, it takes us a long time. It doesn't have to be technology, all of it. Thanks, Martin. It's funny you should mention Norway because although Andrea is Italian, he's actually based in Norway. Um, maybe Andrea, you can add some other examples of this or from other parts of your work as a specialist, maybe in satellite data, mm. uh, working with satellite data for climate research. 
Yeah, I mean, I'll, uh, try to rephrase an old joke. What happens in Norway doesn't stay in Norway, <laughs> or what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. Uh, in the sense that there are several several effects of climate change that, are, of course, affect the this area. This applies to all the areas in Europe and in the world, the Mediterranean and the Atlantic. Uh, that uh, could uh, could have um, uh, some repercussions also on uh, on other areas far away from here, also on the tropical tropical areas in the world. Uh, I I think of, uh, of I think of what uh, what has been changing in uh, in terms of uh, oceanographic variables, uh, all these. Uh, uh, global warming that uh, provided an increase of temperature. Uh, um, led to have these uh, these issues in terms of uh, sea level rise that are affecting uh, all uh, the, the, the urban and the water infrastructures uh, in uh, in northern Norway, rather than uh, than are affecting uh, uh, the the occurrence of uh, disaster events uh, such as uh, landslides or or snow avalanches even more. Um, reconnecting to, to what, what has been said and uh, to what, uh, what also uh, Professor Pauli said in an in inspiring introduction, there, there is actually a, a sort of a marine uh, version of uh, the example that he made. Uh, in a sense that uh, seaweed has been always found uh, to be a uh, a big issue for uh, all the fishermen and the people involved in the aquaculture industry, especially here in, uh, in Northern Norway. Um, now the, uh, at, uh, in academia and in the university, but also uh, uh, taking advantage of uh, the richness that the diversity of the different sectors might bring, there are several projects that are uh, focusing on um, nature based uh, the implementation of nature based solutions to, uh, to address this problem. And so uh, this, uh, uh, this led to tests of using seaweed as a uh, raw feed material for the fishes that are uh, in the aquacultural uh, sites. Uh, this uh, uh, turned out to be a, a very good example for. Uh, uh, how uh, nature, uh, our sustainable solutions can can come from from the tradition and from the from the uh, from the nature itself. Um, but uh, it also turned out to be also a nice example of how to engage people in the sense that this uh, was uh, a big problem that fishermen had, and uh, uh, with uh, academic studies, it was possible to provide them with some solutions that was. Uh, that, that were uh, addressing their uh, everyday issues, also helping from an, uh, an economic perspective. Um, in that respect, uh, the use of, uh, of remote sensing, I'm, I'm part of the Earth Observation Group at the, at the university, uh, has, uh, has provided a lot of added value in that respect. And, and in that respect, uh, the policies provided by the, the European Commission in uh, the open, open data uh, policies for uh, for all uh, uh, remote sensing uh, data that are acquired through the Copernicus program uh, provided a bigger step in, in that direction. Thanks, Andrea. Um, we're actually very close to the end of the session. Um, there is one last thing I would like to uh, to ask, and I think we only really have time for Chrissy's uh, response. But having seen the video, I know that it's it's a good way to end the session. I think so. Um, I think the question really is how to ensure a positive focus in these communications, in engaging with uh, various diverse stakeholders in, in the work that needs to happen, um, and what can, what can we do about it? So last word to Chrissy, please. Yeah, this is another one of those uh, questions that I like to answer. Um, so. Uh, we, we really need to uh, focus on communication. Um, as, I, as I age and as I mature through this process, myself as a, as a professor, I see that um, uh, our emphasis really, I mean, I, I, now my, my budgets uh, are much larger, the budgets that go towards communication. Uh, why? Because communication is so, so, so important. At the end of the day, it is not what we do in a lab or among a group of experts. It is what we bring outside. So uh, we need to be uh, innovative. 
uh, our innovation should not just stop at sensors uh, and um, other technologies and computers. Uh, our innovation should focus on uh, becoming uh, more uh, easily communicable with the public on uh, bringing new tools. I mean, uh, we've been trying in our pro in Arsinoi, uh, we're planning virtual reality experiments that will show people uh, what, what the world that we imagine looks like. Uh, so all these, uh, uh, all these tools should be used, digital twins that can show people on the screen uh, why uh, things are progressing the way they are, uh, what the data look like, information. All this needs to be included in our tools and need to be central in our, uh, in our designs. Uh, we do get smarter through uh, artificial intelligence, through our technologies, but we need to show that and communicate it with the people in an innovative way that will actually uh, attract their attention and will pass the right messages to the right people and step away, of course, uh, of uh, fear-based communication. Thanks, Chrissy. Thank you very much to all of the panelists from me. And I'd like to just very briefly hand you back to Andrea to end the session. Thank you everybody for taking part and for the audience participation too. Excellent. And I would like to thank you, Laura, for navigating us through this session so um, so so peacefully. Um, uh, we we hope that you will like this session and thank you all for, for joining. Thank you uh, again uh, on my behalf to all the panelists. Uh, this is the 10th the uh, version of the ICSD. It is uh, 10 years that SDSN, uh, SDSN uh, exists. So we're more than glad to, to welcome you at uh, some record numbers. Uh, today in this virtual room, we were uh, 150. Uh, so we encourage you to explore the program of the ICSD to attend other sessions as well. Uh, right after this one, there are three parallel sessions, one on SDG localization, the other one on uh, gender in the SDG implementation. Uh, and another one on carbon sinks in construction and transportation industry. Uh, as uh, you may also know, SDSN is an academic network. So if you are an academic, you may want to engage with SDSN and have your university or your knowledge institution uh, become a member of uh, SDSN. We are already over uh, 1,600 around the world. So feel free to explore our website and reach out uh, to join us. And with that, I would like to thank you all again and uh, see you next time. Thank you. Thank you very much for a fantastic session. Thank you.